Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's stream. If I seem a little tired tonight, it's because, well, I decided to help my housemates out in the garden. I've decided that I should have at least some form of weekend, so every day or every Sunday, I try and not sit at, uh, in front of the computer, as I think this is a, a good idea to do from time to time. Anyway, so I went out and decided to help them in the garden, and they had a very little project, which I said, okay, well, I'll happily help with, and um, someone had had an old pool, a, a fish pond or something in their garden, and there was this sort of hessian mesh mat poking through, and uh, we just wanted to rip that up, and um, we said, well, there we go, that's, that's simple enough to do, and so let's do that. Well, we ripped it up, only to discover that underneath was this large cavernous hole. That mesh had been acting like a, a rooftop, and no one had actually stepped onto it for a long time because it was full of rocks and pebbles and things, and it wasn't very, very accessible. But now that we ripped this stuff up, we had this gigantic hole. So from about, I don't want to exaggerate, but from about 1 o'clock this afternoon until 7 p.m., I have been digging out in the garden, hauling rocks and doing all kinds of crazy and wonderful things, which has been absolutely awesome. My hands are blistered and wrecked. They look beautiful and pink, but if I have a slight red glow to me, it's because I'm sunburnt, because I forgot to wear a hat. I mean, it's the first time I've been out there doing this sort of hard labour in a very, very long time. So, yes, as Tavern 3 says, exercise, hiss, absolutely. So, there we go. I'm just... Um, so you'll have, to, you'll have to be extra engaging today, but I think you always are, so I don't have a particular problem with that. Now, I'm going to move this down here because I cannot tell you, it is actually difficult to look all the way up at that screen over there. It's like, oh, it's, my head will just look. Anyway, I'm super excited to be here tonight. I think we're going to have a whole lot of stuff coming through. And um, so if you are asking a question, if you're new to the stream, put the word question in front and uh, then I can see it pop out nice and big. Uh, hang on a moment. I don't think I saw your text. No. Why is that? Let's, uh, there we go. Oh, why are you over there? That's in the wrong place. Let's move you over here and let's make you nice and big. So there we are. Everyone can now see what's going on. OK, that's better. Right, so now I can move this back here, and we see we are off. Leticia Ferreria, Leticia Ferreira asks, I never feel confident when I'm playing as a GM. I feel like I'm not delivering the plot, like I'm sounding confusing. What can I do to improve? Leticia, all I can say to you is that next week a new GM video drops, which is, as far as I can remember, all about adjudication. And adjudication is really just a fancy word for making decisions as the game master. And it's one of the core pillars, I think, that makes up a game master is this adjudication, the ability to make decisions on time. Now, I know you're specifically referencing to story, but part of adjudication is maintaining the flow of the story. So to, next week's videos will help you. Then I know that there's another video which I recorded called, well, I don't know, I, I think it's actually called Story, and it is the five steps that your adventure should contain. It's moving away from the old sentence. I mean, the sentence still works beautifully, and if you don't know what the sentence is, go and check it out on my YouTube channel. I think it was the very first video that I ever released was on, on, on sentence and how to make that sentence. But there are now, I've looked at it, I've re-looked at it, and, and having had feedback from people, there are five steps that you need to have in your adventure. And if you have those, it might make the adventure seem simple, but in actual fact, that adventure will be absolutely awesome because your players are going to hit all of the points. You won't have to worry about them not knowing where they're going or what they're doing, and you'll get to your final end goal a lot easier with those five steps. So watch out for those because I think that will be um, that will definitely be something there. Okay, AK Writer says, on RPG Table Finder, yep, absolutely, um, is there a feature where GMs can offer something like GM for Hire, or how would you recommend approaching such ventures? There isn't a section for GM uh, for Hire, which um, we hadn't ever thought about. I will send your request, I'm actually going to do it right now, because I will... I, I won't remember it. So I'm going to send a text message right now. This is awful, absolutely awful. And if you watch my videos on what don't do, don't do, uh, is text during a stream or a session. I'm doing that right now because that was I will absolutely forget. 
Um, add to RPG table finder a GM for higher section. Um, so GMs can promote themselves. Uh, I'll add it to the selection. I know that what the Web Goblin is currently doing, which I think is particularly exciting, is he is completely overhauling the look of RPG Table Finder. Now, if you don't know what RPG Table Finder is, we wrote RPG... Well, the Web Goblin wrote RPG Table Finder at my request. I said, look, we need to create a platform where gamers, role players particularly, can go and find other role players and, and not have to use any of the, the VTTs that are out there. But uh, yes, so there we go. That is, that is uh, something that we've added. All right, the next question. Watcher24... It's gone. Watcher2417 says, What do you think of the idea of building your own portable village which is located in a pocket universe for the downtime actions? It's certainly a really interesting idea. There are some logistics which come to mind. How does that village survive? How big is this pocket universe? Because... Dairy comes from cows, which take a lot of grazing. Wool comes from sheep. You know, so if you can explain to me how this village survives in that pocket dimension, that would be great. Now, something that you could very well do, and I think that this would limit it in terms of the players using it as an escape option, is that what they would have to do is not travel to the pocket dimension, because otherwise, middle of a combat, the players are losing, they go into the pocket dimension and they close the door behind them. Right. What I would do is I would say, OK, you need to find four acres or five hectares or pick a, a fairly large space. Or if, if you're worried that they won't know what acres and hectares are, talk about it needs to be a mile square of open field. It can have a river in it and it can have a forest or whatever you like. And then you lay down your village and for the next 24 hours, the village exists there. And whatever is there is what the village will make use of. So if you lay it, lay it down in mountains, it will be a mountainous village and they'll have some mining operations going on. And the, the, the fun part could be the NPCs stay the same, but their output changes. So Svigert, he's on my mind at the moment, Svigert in village number one in the mountains is a blacksmith. And then when the, NP, when the PCs throw that uh, little circle pocket dimension down in a swampy area... Savigad is now an alligator hunter or something like that. It could be quite fun. Um, so, yes, that's how I would do it if you want my opinion. G Master says, How should I run? <laughs> Time I need to think and swallow, yes. Mm. Um, G Master says, How should I run a heist? You should run a heist by watching my video uh, called How to Run a Heist. I think I actually think that is what it is called. Is it running a heist? Anyway, in order to run a heist, G-Master, here are the salient points in a few seconds. I'm going to try and do this at my new speed, by the way, which is for all the youngsters out there who like a little bit of speed. In order to run a heist, you need to have a component of individuals that have been gathered together. One of them needs to be the safe cracker, one of them needs to be the driver, one of them needs to be the individual that's going to be responsible for getting the people into the space or out of the space. You will also need someone who's going to distract the guards or who knows the guards or who will impersonate the guards and allow everybody to get into the building in the first place. Once everybody has managed to be pulled together, and that should be four, four or five different adventures, by the way, gathering these individuals. Usually it's about breaking the lock breaker out of prison. It's about getting the seductress out of some kind of bad situation with her pimp or whatever the uh, owner of her might be. So you have four or five adventures assembling the team that will conduct the heist. Then the characters need to go and snoop out the point that they are going to heist from. They need to just scan out the joint, basically. You need to give them routines. You need to give them guards. You need to give them patrols. You need to give them an opportunity to be able to get in there so that they can see what's going on and make sure that they have a plan that comes together. And, of course, once they start doing the plan, you shouldn't fail the plan because they put the plan together and they spent an entire bunch of sessions trying to put that plan together and you really shouldn't stop them from finishing their plan however once they get out of that store and the thing that they have stolen of course should leave on to a bigger or better adventure which actually is a hook so whatever it is that they've stolen should have greater ramifications for the rest of the kingdom and not just for the treasure that they have now achieved they should also be able to steal something else that has nothing to do with the primary plot but which allows them to have a reward for having done this plot in the first place all of the individuals who are responsible for this uh, heist thing will betray the party and of course try and make off with the thing that they have stolen and there you go. 
that is what you need in order to run a heist game. Dragon says, Relationships between races that have drastic aging rates. An elf that lives 1,600 years to a human that lives 80 years. What role-playing problems would you foresee? Elf mourning human death. Well, I think the best way, the best way is to quite literally look at the implications of Aragorn and um, the woman. Completely forgot her name. I wanted to say Eowyn, but he didn't go with Eowyn because he went with the elf. Uh, why is her name gone out of my head? Oh my goodness! Why is 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 her? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the hell is her name. What the? <laughs> anyway, Aragorn and Liv Tyler's character. I have no idea what her name is. Anyway. She and he, he, th there's a whole thing about the fact that she will not die and he will. And if you look, Arwen, Arwen, thank you, Arwen, Arwen, there we go. So if you look at that whole situation and you then look at something like that ancient film now, but which was an amazing film at the time, Interview with a Vampire, there was the same problem, is that you have these people who do live for a long time and the mortals die. So generally speaking, the long-lived ones, this is according to the memes and the tropes that go around and we must be slaves to those. But generally, accordingly, they say that we just don't engage in relationships with the short-lived races. It isn't a, it's, a, it's like having a pet, a little dog. They're there for 15 or 18 years, and then sadly they leave us. It's the same as I would imagine elves seeing humans in that particular case. So I think that what you would have to do is you would have to figure out a way. Maybe this is the first love that that long-lived character has, in which case they haven't yet been burned. So a young elf falling in love with a human might be plausible. But once that elf has gone through three or four human lifetimes, because if you think about it, a 200-year elf has gone through almost eight generations already of people, of humans. That's a lot. I knew your great, 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 great grandfather. That's a lot of iterations. And it gets really creepy. It's like, I slept with your great grandfather. I slept with your great grandfather, grandfather's grandfather. I'm. It's weird. So best would be to just hold back a little bit um i, I would i would make it more of a, a platonic uh, enjoyment of the wonder and curiosity that the young human has uh than than anything else it it, it is tricky for a reason hot rod 41994 says do you have any tips for running creatures or entities with alien mindsets for example, spirits in Werewolves the Apocalypse, or Kami in L5R, or the Lithid in 5th edition. Alien Mindsets, the biggest challenge, without going into it too far, in my opinion, the biggest challenge that you have with Alien Mindsets is, for us, it's very difficult to imagine what an Alien Mindset is. Anything we imagine is effectively coming from our own mindset. So... When you look at an alien mindset, some of the things that you can play on are ideas or concepts that are foreign to us. So I would say, okay, well, an alien mindset might look upon life as going backwards. So the elderly are seen as infants, whereas the youngsters are put in charge. Turning what we take for granted on its head is a good way of doing that. Aliens might also look at the the existing things that are happening now and here as curious because the aliens can shift through time. It really depends on the base perspective of that alien creature. It really does. So for telepaths and things, we see this every now and again, but telepath telepathy is something that is alien to most of us and so to someone who has always had telepathy it's like saying well what do you mean you're not telepathic everyone's telepathic and so there would be perhaps a very big misunderstanding of that entire space and again a patronizing you're just not as evolved as we are so i would think about that um when looking at that, Frederick Schmidt says, how can I make a scenario in which the players have to decide to side with one of two villains to overcome the other? Interesting. All right. So the, the biggest challenge that you have with regards to 
players making a choice as to which villain to join is that they very, very seldom will actually join either of those two sides. They'll try and play both angles. They'll betray the one at the end anyway. Uh, and they, the villains will betray them as well. I mean, that's what we kind of expect. In terms of making it interesting, it should be a sacrificial choice, usually. I mean, it's sacrifice of join me or watch a million of your humans die. Actually, you should join me because I won't kill a million humans. I will, however, sacrifice a thousand children. It's got to be one of those kind of decisions where it's like, well, we're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. That's what makes it interesting. What makes it even more interesting, and this takes a little bit of setup, but you can certainly do it if you've got time before your players encounter this individual, is that if they met an NPC who said, listen, I know you're going to go and speak to Agamorex, just bear in mind, Agamorex is an absolute liar and will tell you whatever it is that you want to hear. Because then that situation is the villain, the worst villain says, uh, there's no sacrifice if you join me. If you join me, we will save everybody. Now, the players know that he is lying. They then look to the alternative and the alternative says, I can't offer you that thousands are going to die in my name but once we are done we will be in a better situation and he will be dead so what you're doing is the players now going wow okay so do we trust you see again see what i'm doing is i'm setting up the players need to make some kind of decision they need to make some kind of rationale there could be npcs as well supporting those villains who step forward and say well i have already pledged my axe to my lord i believe that what he is doing is true the other villain has an NPC stepping forward saying, Do not believe that coward! He does not know what he says. Join us! We'll make sure that you're all right in the end. The more pressure you can put on the players to make that decision, the better. And then, of course, that's what you've got to put on top of them, is pressure. This decision should not be made in a nice, comfortable place. This is not Nero being offered the pill in the Matrix. This is the players on the edge of a volcano that's about to explode, and they need to choose a course of action, or else a village down there is going to die. So you want to put them under that under that pressure. And that, that really makes it very, very interesting. I think so, anyway. Diburu... Oh, that didn't come out right. Dibuyaru says, a Dramatic structure makes exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and revelation. How far did that go? Wow. Okay. Um, which elements every adventure must have? Dramatic structure is very, very useful, and the sentence is built around the original ideas of dramatic structure. We tell a story in the same way. What I realize, though, is that this is not necessarily helpful if one doesn't know exactly what should happen during uh, rising action. What is rising action? What's, what's, what is that? And that's basically increasing tension. So there is a video coming out in the next couple of weeks. I don't know exactly when because the Web Goblin handles all of that. But there is a video coming out in the next week where those five five things, exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and revelation, I've broken them into, I call them my RPG-friendly spaces. So they're RPG-based things. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but effectively it's getting plot, traveling to plot, discovering that plot is not the actual plot, traveling to the new plot, and then killing the plot. Now, those five things allow you to create five great, great encounters. And that was one of the reasons why I did Wizards of Kanbari, is because if you watch the Wizards of Kanbari, week one or week two, chapter one or chapter two, it doesn't matter. Literally, episode one of both of them was getting plot. The player characters didn't necessarily know what the plot was specifically, but they knew that there was something up. Something was happening and they were involved in it. They then traveled to plot. They went around and they went and tried to find out what was going on. In the one case, it was to a woodcutter's camp. In the other case, it was to the interpretive dance lady and the students. Then they discover that the plot is not the actual plot. So what they thought was the plot that they'd been given 
they now discover is not the real plot and so on and so on. So wait for that video. It explains it a lot better than I'm doing right now. But th you are right. I mean, those those we use those. We just rename them so that they're a bit more user friendly in terms of designing adventures. Uh, OK, well, Watcher 2417 came up again on my. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. Step to uh, step into my beach. Step into my beach. I don't know what that is. Question. What are good ways to introduce a villain without being too obvious or leading them? Here's a question. Why don't you want to be obvious? I think a mistake that a lot of GMs make, whether they are experienced or inexperienced, is to try and be too clever because they're worried that the players are going to go, well, that's so obvious. That's too obvious. That's just it can't be that. And I heard that in the Wizards of Conbari. Uh, literally the last week, their players were discussing after, I think it was episode two, and one of the players went, well, it can't be that obvious because Guy doesn't do that kind of stuff. Well, I did. And at the end of the episode, everyone was smiling and happy and joyful that that was the way that it had actually played out. So something that I've learned is that we can sometimes try and be too sneaky. And then we end up in that situation of someone else who asked a question a little bit earlier on. They worry that the players don't then understand who is the bad guy or what is the actual plot. So when you're trying to be subtle, I, again, I work on five clues. So that's my basic principle. So if you want it to be subtle, but you want them to figure it out, because ultimately you do. I mean, they, they, if they don't figure it out, they're never going to go and confront the villain. I work on five clues. So if you want the villain to be sneaky, the first clue can be very cryptic. They, the players see the villain and the villain is holding a book of death. And the villain says, oh, this is not mine. I just found this lying down here on the bench. It's plausible. And, you know, the, the villain can play along with that. Then you give another clue that the villain is evil later on for another adventure and later on and later on until eventually either the players go, you know what, this character is actually very, very evil or uh, they're still oblivious to it. And you give them the fifth clue. If after the fifth clue they haven't got it, either you are so sneakily subtle that a sneakily subtle snail wouldn't even notice that you were being sneakily subtle or your players are not up to the challenge of playing the game that you are trying to play. And ultimately, we have to make sure that everybody's happy. So if you want, I don't want to say smarter players, but if you want players who are more on the ball, you're going to need to go and find a different group. And for that, you can use rpgtablefinder.com. Yeah, 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 I know. Anyway. Okay, so so yes, that's that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Right. Oh, where are we? Aaron Floyd says, what do you think of this for a level 10 boss fight? What do I think of what for a level 10 boss fight? I'm very tired today, Aaron Floyd. You need to be very, very gentle with my little brain tonight, please. Let's be, let's be clear on that one. Okay, at 25 past, so in two minutes, I'm going to show you some cool stuff. Um, so, yes, you're going to have to expand on that, please. Xander the Green says, How can I support a player writing their very first one-shot without accidentally taking over? Um, give them the five steps. Give them the sentence. Give them some suggestions about pacing. And then let them go and do it. And then when they come back, don't read what they've given you. Ask them to tell you. Tell them. Ask them to tell you. Okay, what is the introduction to the plot and listen to them and if after a minute they haven't told you what the introduction to the plot is their one shot is going to be too long too long and it's too complicated and it shouldn't be that way and their focus might be in the wrong place so then you can simply say no 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 give it to me in a minute or less and then they should be able to give it to you in a minute or less and say well the plot is there's this mad mastermind who's trying to take over the world by using fungus which absorbs magic and prevents people from casting spells so his army can move in and destroy them all because magic is very common in that world there we go there's the entire plot in in one sentence right so i would i would do it that way i would i would use the structure use the sentence and then get them to answer in one minute bursts and if they can't do that then it doesn't work but you shouldn't read what they've written 
You don't need to waste your time reading what they've written if they can't tell you verbally, unless you can't communicate with them, in which case then obviously you have to read it. Um, Acreol says, after playing a campaign, do you take time to look backwards and find something in the campaign that you didn't like and try to prevent it in future games? Absolutely. Two weeks ago, I released a video called What I Did Wrong. And that was me reflecting on what I had done wrong in in the uh, Wizards of Kambari Chapter 1 series. So, yes, I look back all the time and try and figure out and say, okay, well, that was it. And what I have figured out, the big secret, although it's not a secret, I think every GM that has done this a lot knows, the biggest secret is that the more complicated we try and make an adventure, the less likely it is to work. And yet... The simpler the adventure, the more entertaining it often is. Because we're only responsible for events we're not, and, and, and for plot. We're not responsible for the story. And the story is really what role-playing is all about. And the story comes from the players. So that's what I've learned. Anyway. All right. It is time. So please hold your questions. And if you have just asked a question, please re-ask it in a little bit. I want to talk about... Um, they're, some, they're, they're friends of mine, as a matter of fact. I would say they're friends of mine. Uh, we've chatted once. And, you know, they're, now they're, we're close friends. Anyway. Friends of mine have spoken about this stuff before on the channel, as a matter of fact. And I'm speaking about this stuff again because... I think this may just solve a problem that a lot of people have. Now, I have one. I have a few questions that people ask over and over and over again uh, when they, they, they come onto this particular show. And um, that, that one of the questions is, how do I make overland travel interesting? There are many solutions. I mean, there's the random table. So you roll to see if there's a random event, which I absolutely hate. I don't like that because... Why should dice tell you if something's going to happen or not? You should choose if something is going to happen or not in Overland. Anyway, our friends over at Lawsmith, lawsmith.com, and I'll actually show you their website. Uh, let me just do that, and hopefully you're seeing their website. They've got this series of idea generation decks, and they sent me some to, to, to review, and I have them here with me, and I'll go through them in a little bit. I think it could be quite fun is um, these three. Dungeon Discoveries is what the series is called, and Curious Treasure is the first one. Wilderland Voyage is the second one, and that's the one that's going to help everybody. And then Fumbled Searches. Now, you may recall I did uh, sci-fi a couple of weeks ago, but these ones, I, I, I mean, I like sci-fi, but oftentimes we play fantasy. So these fantasy decks are really cool. Now I'm going to show them to you. And, and what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the Wilderland Voyage first. And we're going to do something that we haven't done in a long time. We're going to do some creative writing. And, well, you're going to do some creative writing. I'm going to sit here and drink coffee and pretend that I don't want to just curl up into a little ball and die. Uh, don't ever get fat. If you're a thin person and you're thinking of getting fat, just don't. It's not worth it. The benefits are just not worth it. Trust me. So I have got here in my hand the Wilderland Voyage deck. Now, um, the cards might not present very... Oh, sorry about that. The, car the cards might not present very well because of the green screen, but that's what the cards look like. They have a top section and a bottom section. The top section oop, is in green, and the bottom section is in purple, so the bottom section might show. So what you do is you take this deck and you randomly shuffle it. And... Da, 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 da. You randomly shuffle it, and then you draw a card, and you read the first words that come to you. Eroded green, all right, an eroded green or eroded green, and then you look at the purple block and you go, oh, an eroded green sundial. The players come across an eroded green stone sundial. That's an adventure hook. It's, it's a micro adventure at the very least. I want you to very quickly, and it's only if you want to, it's only if you want to, of course, these are completely voluntary, but if you do, I will give you some treasure from the treasure decks, which you can keep and use in your next game, courtesy of the great GM and Lawsmith, who came up with this whole thing. So an eroded green, sun, an eroded green stone sundial, 
You need to tell me what is a small adventure that would come out of an eroded green sundial. Uh, specifically an eroded green stone sundial. So off you go and um, start typing that up in chat. You don't have you don't have you have, don't have a lot of characters to type in. So uh, don't do too much of that. Just just a sentence. Uh, the sundial, if the uh, dial of the sundial is turned to noon, the sundial opens up and reveals a set of stairs that goes down into a small dungeon. And there's a toad at the end that gives you a set. Uh, what is a sundial? Uh, it says Watcher 2417. A sundial is one of the most ancient forms that we have of keeping time. And it uses the principle of the movement of the sun. So draw a circle in the sand or on a clay tablet or make it out of stone. Put a straight up object perpendicular to that circle so that it casts a shadow. Now, if you align the sundial correctly to the path of the sun, as the sun moves, the shadow of that vertical upright will be cast onto that circular shape that you have made. Now, all you need to do is you break that circle into uh, 12 separate little wedges, and it will allow you to track the time. It will literally let you see, oh, OK, it's three o'clock, it's four o'clock, it's one o'clock, depending on where the shadow is. Now, of course, it doesn't work when there isn't a sun. You need it to be able to cast a shadow. And there are a whole lot of other errors and errors that come into play when um, the uh, sundial is there and, 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 and equinoxes and all that kind of stuff. But that's the basic principle. We've doing, been doing that for several thousand years. So an eroded green sundial. I see that. Okay, so I think Jeffrey Johnson got in there first. Doesn't tell time, but tells the location of a treasure. I like that. So Jeffrey Johnson, I am going to use Curious Treasure for you because we're going to use your sundial. We're going to go for a little walk and you've gone for a walk and you have found... I'm just pulling out all of these extra cards that they ship with it. You have found... Oh, look at all of these options coming through. It's absolutely wonderful, folks. So, uh, I've lost the name. I've lost the name. Uh, Jeffrey Johnson. Jeffrey Johnson, you have found a silver-laced white fur cloak. A silver-laced white fur cloak. Now, you can come up with what that does. Immediately one thinks, oh, it's protection from cold. It will protect you during a blizzard, perhaps. But maybe that silver-lined fur cloak will allow you to cast a blizzard over a mile once every year when the sundial is pointing to the silver-lined cloak. So there we are. That's what you've got. Make a note of that. A silver-lined fur cloak. Uh, Drake Egloff says, a sundial is... Oh, okay, is explaining what that is. Thank you very much for that. Our Dread Skull says, wiping off the erosion. You see ruin, uh, runes that translate to a place that was lost in time. There are directions to that place. When you arrive at that place, going through hell to get there, of course, you find a colourful striped... <laughs> gemstone bangle a colorful striped gemstone bangle now that's interesting that's interesting what is a colorful striped gemstone now i know of a few gemstones the ones that i can think of that are striped would be tiger's eye tiger's eye is striped or malachite that green stone you could argue that that is striped but it's colorful so perhaps tiger's eye because tiger's eye comes in three colors it comes in natural orange natural red and then you can make blue tiger's eye by baking it in an oven at a very high temperature for a very long time so there we go that's what you find in your uh, journey to this place that was lost in time i do like that uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, jack o lantern says, it might be sort of old place, hidden, uh, uh, old place, old hidden place of worship for some sort of forest, but it's connected to a plant 
closely associated with the sun. Okay, we'll go with that. That gets you a treasure. And don't worry, I'm not going to do this for much longer. That gets you a treasure. That gets you an ornately gilded dragon heart. Wow, that sounds amazing. An ornately, an ornately gilded dragon heart. So this dragon heart is ornately gilded. If you plant it in the ground, because we're talking flowers here, uh, does it give rise to a plant-based dragon? A foley raptor? No, 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 it doesn't. No one liked that video anyway. It's all right. So, uh, yeah, it gives, it gives rise to something. There's a gilded dragon heart at the base of yours. And Xander the Green says, Upon a certain time, a portal opens up to a temple within the Feywild where an old god sleeps. But you only have an hour or else be trapped there forever. Xander the Green, I'm going to say I love this example because it gives a pressure to the party. They only have an hour. And as a result, you get a green ghostly talking skull. Well, that was a pretty straightforward one. So you get a green ghostly talking skull. Perhaps it was something that the god used to use to communicate with his followers, but then he lost the followers, so the skull kind of returned. I mean, that could be interesting. All right, last one. And I know you guys have put through so many options. I mean, I'm six minutes behind in terms of the chat going through this. So I really, really do appreciate it. Um, uh, Trey... Uh, that's uh, Mask Spoker uh, says the, the parents of the players look at a stone sundial that has been eroded by green fungi over the millennia. They agree that it has come time to send their children out to find the cause of the riding, rising tide of anti-magic fungus. There we are. Well, that's that's that is what it is there's an anti-magic fungus that's been going around on this channel we know what it is or we think we know what it is anyway nonetheless at the end of this particular adventure they find a waterproof electrum chime so it is a chime that can be played underwater well that's an interesting one maybe it summons a whale or a mermaid to come to your rescue or to your help so that is the um that is the the deck uh, titled Curious Treasures. It's got that wonderful horse head on the front. So that was Curious Treasures. So that's what you guys got. I'm going to go through a few others, and I'll go back to your questions. So don't worry. Don't worry. Now we're going to go for Fumbled Searches. So what happens when someone is searching a room and they fail their search check or they fail their spot check or whatever your system might be? And I do have to say that they do supply these extra cards with the deck called My Notes. So it's quite nice if you, you found a this and a that, you can just make a little note of that and come back later on to figure out what the hell it is. So the next individuals who got their uh, story through uh, was Inky Design saying the eroded green sundial has rotating rings at its pedestal. The players have a map or riddle to solve and a map comes out of it. Clati classical, but brain is mush. I think it's wonderful. We don't need to be particular. I mean, imagine you come across this green eroded sundial and it's got some rings that you need to do a riddle with. Huh? Okay. Well, what you find, inky design, at the end of your brain mushed riddle is a foul smelling dull knife. A foul-smelling dull knife. Perhaps it smells vaguely of fish or rotting meat, something along those lines. A foul-smelling dull knife. A dull knife in particular. Sorry about that. Silver lined fur cloak seemed much nicer. But you got a, you got a, it's a dull knife. Knife, you could sharpen that up. Uh, Nobun, Nobunaga says it, it does not point in the proper direction. It points to a lost castle where the people have been magically entrapped. Well, you can't go wrong with, um, what would it be? Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. So perhaps your adventure would be Beauty and the Sundial. I don't know. All right, so you find at the end of your journey oh, a slightly moist sword hilt. A slightly moist sword hilt. The other options, by the way, were slightly moist torn trousers. Ew. A slightly moist music box. Weird. A slightly moist stone in the wall. Well, that leads to another adventure, I think. That's wonderful. But you've got a slightly moist sword hilt. So someone left it in a puddle, perhaps. 
Okay, and just the last... We're going to do two more and then we're done. I hope you guys are having fun. I certainly am. Right, so that was Nobunaga. Um, Johnny Allen says a slime desert setting. I'm not sure that fulfills the whole story, Johnny Allen. Uh, Ed Andrew says inscription under corrosion sundial says the world ends tomorrow at dawn. It's an interesting one because there's a time pressure there, but I think the inscription would need to be new in order for it to be scary. Because if it's an old inscription, it's like, oh, yeah, this was clearly wrong. Um, and this is a countdown clock on it. That could be interesting. As the sun moves, the, the countdown happens, and it's in centuries. Anyway, uh, Ed Andrew, you get a scorched bottle cork. A scorched bottle cork. Now, if you think that's silly, I once made an incredibly powerful artifact, which was a cork with a needle through it. If anybody can tell me what a cork with a needle through it can do, I'll give you a choice between a fumbled search or a curious treasure. And so the very last one that we are going to look at for now is Beyond the Six says, The sundial is frequented by a colony of pixies. They are not automatically hostile, but will base their behaviour on the reaction of the PCs to a harmless prank. <laughs> there we go. So you get a badly repaired... <laughs> you get a badly repaired iron doorknob. That's what you find after placating these pixies. They hand you a badly repaired iron doorknob. Now, every card, there is a question that's come through. Every card has four options at the top and four options at the bottom. And I don't think all of them work together immediately. I mean, the top option here is rotting cabbages. So if you went with um, aged alabaster rotting cabbages it, it that would be a sculpture of rotting cabbages I'm not sure how that would work i mean it, that's the beautiful thing is that this stuff is absolutely brilliant and i think you could buy a deck of these put them in the middle of the table and then say to the player right you're doing a search i'll make your search check for you you failed oh okay well you failed draw a card from the deck draw two cards from the deck um, or player one and player three draw two cards. I mean, or you could just draw two cards and then just read it out for them. I think either would work. Um, so there you are. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of these wonderful suggestions that have come through. I think you can see here definitely the power. I mean, we'll go back. We'll just do another of those wilderness locations. The players, you're traveling across the Great Plains towards your next great battle when you find a crude goblinoid... Soldier Memorial. A crude goblinoid soldier memorial. I mean, these are just pure, pure gold. If you are sitting going, oh, my adventure, I'm sitting at this part of the video, or I'm sitting at this part of the adventure, and I'm trying to figure out what to do, and I don't want my players... To, oh, they're going to come across a time-warping tree god temple. There we go. That's what they're going to come across. It's interesting, I think. So there we are. Right. Um, so, what did I say? If you came up with an idea, or if you gave an answer, or if you asked a question or something, you'd get a thing. Oh, yes. A cork with a needle. Cork with a needle. What does a cork with a needle do for you? What does it allow you to do? So, let's see. Um, what have we got? What have we got? Who got it first? Oh, lots of answers came through on that one. Everyone getting it right. Of course, it's not that cryptic. It's not that difficult. Um, a moist music box could create a siren's call. Yes, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, a moist sword hilt dragon burped up the remains of a paladin. <laughs> yes, I like that. I like that. Um, Ed R. Andrew says, uh, it's a compass. You were the first one to get that. Stormlord D says compass. And, um, yeah, uh, Kenna Pops, Zana the Green, jack o -Lantern, the Tenshi Tobias said it. Um, Driston Ross the Seventh said it. The Transient One said it. So um, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, what I did with this particular cork, and I, I, forgive me if some of you have already heard this already, 
So this cork with the needle in it, which was, and multi soldier quite said it needs to be magnetized. The needle needs to be magnetized. That's absolutely right. So uh, it does need to do to to have that absolutely. Um, and um, what I did with this needle through the cork was that uh, when you put it into a bowl of water, it would spin. But when the person held the bowl with this cork in it, the cork would change depending on the destiny of the character holding it. So I had one character, they held the bowl and the cork burst into flames and turned to dust, turning the water into dust as well. And they didn't know why, so then they handed the bowl to somebody else. They thought they'd actually broken it. And that person, as they touched it, the cork reformed, and it pointed directly upwards. The needle pointed out of the bowl directly upwards. For others, it changed direction and that sort of thing. So it really was an interesting, an interesting scenario. They destroyed that artifact uh, later on to try and save the world, I think. But um, the fun thing for me was trying to figure out how to get that into their destiny outcome. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Kirk Wagner, I like how your mind thinks. A needle and a cork, yes, it is a compass. But how about a poison tipping or a poison trap in a wine bottle? Yeah, absolutely, I do like that. I do like that. Okay, so um, uh, the prize, the prize is you get to choose. Either it's a fumbled, a fumbled search, a fumbled search, or a um curious treasure a fumbled search or a curious tre treasure um that you can choose from and i believe that it really was um and now i've lost it now i've lost it. i'm gonna go look for it i believe it was ed r andrew who came up with compass first i can't see anybody else in there so yeah you get to choose a curious treasure a curious a treasure. I've got the decks here in front of me. So, curious treasure. You get uh, da -da 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 a blazing hot. <laughs> Mustache wax. A blazing hot moustache wax. So when you put it on to wax your moustache, it's blazing hot. And I would say gives whatever character uses that uh, the ability to have a fire breath attack. I would say that that works really, really well there. Like I said, some of these things are just absolutely insane and wonderful. And I mean, I, I would count myself as being someone who is, is pretty good at coming up with odd magical items on the fly or non-magical items I mean, it doesn't have to be but um I, I i these decks are absolutely wonderful because they they're things that you don't expect so off you go uh blazing hot mustache wax that's absolutely awesome that's coming from Lawsmith. Now, before we leave Lawsmith and go back to your questions for the last few minutes of the show, I just need to talk about their next upcoming Kickstarter because I think it's going to be another awesome one. It's another deck of cards that we want to get involved in. So there we go. Hopefully you're seeing that uh, now on the screen. Let me just double check that you are. Yes, you are. And um, Heroic Challenges. Now, this, I think, is quite interesting. This is the preview page. It's only dropping a little bit later on. So I will copy this into the chat for you all to have a look at. And um, these are challenges. And so what that means, very, very roughly, is that you would draw a card. And the card might say, uh, let me try and see... Um escape cheat or save from death escape cheat or save from death so if you achieve that you then have the card and you can say i've achieved that so i demand to be given a gleaming onyx lucky charm because that's what i want and um yeah so it's 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 just adding options to your your gaming table i think you could see how much fun how many options came up from the suggestions that you guys put forward i really wish i could read through all of those um and 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 give each of you treasure because i would love to do that i would absolutely love to do that uh but yes uh 
again, I don't show stuff that I don't actually use myself. And for those of you that might think that I don't, once long ago, I did a talk on Easy Roller Dice. And here is that Easy Roller Dice tray that I've been using for Kanbari. It arrived from Japan. Yay! So, yeah, these cards are absolutely brilliant. They sent them through to me said, would you review them? I said, yes, absolutely. Because I do think they're a lot of fun. So it's four options per category and two categories per card. And I think it says 40,000 replayable combinations. Now, I, I, I mean, that, that's, that's brilliant. We're never going to need 40,000 replayable combinations. We've got 10 minutes to go before the end of today's show. So if you have got some questions, now is the time to ask them. Otherwise, I will be back for live sessions with the GM next week um, to, to, to handle whatever was not on Sid. Um, in today's show. So, Darjeeling Stormforge says, I'm trying to make a powerful steel dragon into a warlock patron. How can I tweak the war treat blah, 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 blah. How can I tweak the warlock spells and class to fit the dragon, who's all about spreading wisdom to those who need it? That is a good question. And I think that when we look at trying to match and make things work, you don't want to to completely reforge stuff and do things along those lines because your GM is going to get confused and your other players are going to get confused. You're doing a what? What's that? What's that? So the steel dragon. What color is the steel dragon's essence, if you like? Is it a steely gray? I mean, so your spells would all have a steely gray color to them. In terms of the dragon's edict of wisdom and spreading wisdom, I think it would be more in keeping, yes, you still have Eldritch Blast and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, you could change it to like Awakened Blast where the creature gets hit and has a realization that they don't know what they think they know and what they think they know they don't actually know and, and that sort of thing which causes them mental anguish. You could certainly do those kinds of things where you, you're building it in, but you have to be very, very careful and also consult with your GM or if you are the GM, make sure that you're consulting with the player that they're happy for those modifications to happen in the first place. Because again, like I said, it can sometimes cause con confusion. Watcher2417 says, what do you think of the sentence? Lord Ferox wants to rule Libertas when the song The Grim Death was sung. By the time the song The Grim Death was sung. I'm, sh I'm sure you mean that, perhaps. However, he has difficulties using aggressive politics, intimidation, violence, magic, and science because the other leaders of the Libertas resist him. It isn't a bad qu uh, sentence, Watcher 2417. We have an individual who wants to achieve something by a specific time. I'm not necessarily seeing a, a, a hook for the players. How are the players going to get involved unless the players are part of the other leaders? Are they part of the other leaders? Um, is he using the party to intimidate other leaders or to be violent against other leaders? So I, I would just look for, for that kind of, of hook. I mean, to be horrifically blunt, aggressive politics... Any scriptwriter will tell you a political movie is always difficult to write because you're going to have a winner and you're going to have a loser. Um, so to keep the tension and all that kind of stuff is 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 quite tricky. So perhaps he's having difficulty getting it using brutal means. Then, oh, okay, so the party is going to get downtrodden by him. It's more like Bev Morda from Willow where she's just evil and nasty and aggressive rather than i think it's just aggressive politics it's like oh he's using aggressive politics when is politics not aggressive perhaps otherwise i think it's a perfectly fine sentence i would i would now say okay well how do the players get involved ak writer says what's keeping you from doing so it's not like anybody will punish you for doing the stream longer right uh what's keeping me from from not answering more questions and stuff uh it's nearing nine o'clock here and i find that if i if i well to be absolutely honest as much as i love spending time talking talking to you guys and tonight i could probably go for another hour without a problem it's about setting precedent and i found that in the past sometimes i'd get stuck or not stuck that's the wrong word i would get engaged talking to everybody and then lose track of time and that's not necessarily very good for sleep patterns and that sort of thing or when i was in japan my day would suddenly vanish like last night 
we did the two hour stream of the world building hello world and then i hung out for about an hour in the discord chat with everybody from that hello world discord it was absolutely wonderful to do so but unfortunately there are rule systems to be written and there are other things that need to be done so one does have to 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 measure one's time unfortunately it just it is what it is and also again i mean it's a youtube algorithm thing and they they it's, twitch is fine with it youtube is is not so so fine with it a channel for videos maybe says question how to make strad appear while startling the players how to make him appear while startling the players strad 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 we love strad the vampire i I would have Strahd appear and startle the players by having him burst into their existence with a stake through his chest, blood gushing from his mouth, and him saying, I need your help, or we're all going to die. If they attack him, it's a ruse, of course, and he was just setting them up, and da-da-da-da-da, and he's at full power, and he beats them up, and then he leaves. If they go along with it, well, isn't that a surprising way? Uh, do you expect Strahd to appear wounded? And who the hell wounded and took out Strahd? That's an interesting one. So, again, however you have him appear, it should always elicit a question from the players going, huh? How did he, what are the, da, 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 without eliciting a metagame question of, but Strahd can't do that because he doesn't have those powers because I've read the book 16 times and I know all of his powers and teleportation is not one of them shouldn't have that kind of player in your game grumble grumbles too late whatever um ride door draconis says my players will meet several species that are capable of telepathy any advice how do i indicate that they hear voices in their head one of the things that we did um there's okay so you have two options as far as i understand it and there are other options but they might not be as neat or as efficient two options first option is when you hold your hand up in a shape or a style, or perhaps you are doing something in front of your mouth, so it sort of makes your mouth look as if it's blocked, then it's quite easy to say that I'm using telepathy whenever you see me doing this. I am speaking directly into your mind. The alternative is to use text messaging or Discord, especially if you're playing online like most of us are these days. You can type in chat, but if you are a vulture typist, so as a vulture, you circle and drop as you look for the keys. Um, I love that expression when I heard that. Anyway, um, so yeah, um, there you are. There you are. There you are. Um, forgot where I was going with that. Anyway, that's what you should do with, with telepathy. Uh, conclusion we need time with ourselves says boy well absolutely i mean there, 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 there is that as well there is definitely that as well uh, okay uh, question the transient one no damien rookwood well thank you for that donation i really do appreciate it it's absolutely awesome and damien has a question i'll come to the transient one's question shortly damien's question is should my next one shot enemy be nazi molemen or Nazi Eldritch Horrors. How are you and your community faring the epidemic? Well, I'm faring the epidemic absolutely fine, except that I now go and do gardening, it seems, on a Sunday, and that will kill me tomorrow. I don't think there's going to be any work done. I'm going to be just lying dead going, I need another series to watch. I've got so many series to watch, actually. That's not even that's not a true statement. So anyway, right. Um, I think the community is doing fairly well. I'm very, very, very happy to see... A lot of names here that I have seen over the course of the week. So that's absolutely awesome. Um, but yes, okay. So again, uh, obviously Nazis are part of your world. Uh, Nazi molemen have the element of surprise insofar as they can burrow in through things. I think the thing that's maybe a bit more interesting about Nazi molemen is perhaps they, bur they burrow up to walls, but they don't actually go through. They listen. So there's lots of... Those kinds of things. The exciting part for mole men, of course, is that once the players find out that the mole men are involved, there are lots of long, dark corridors that the mole men have been digging. And never underestimate that a mole can dig vertically as well as uh, horizontally. So those tunnel systems could be absolute chaos, sudden drops of 50 feet. Because the mole doesn't care. The mole simply drills next to it and goes down using the, the, the earth to support itself. So that could be very fun. Meanwhile, the transient... Uh, well, sorry. So El, uh, Nazi Eldritch Horrors, on the other hand, 
they certainly could work. I would make sure then that they are all um, very beautiful, sexy young people who initially appear as refugees and the party is helping them. And then when they try and seduce members of the party, and again, it is very important that you are um, aware that they should be consenting to this kind of behavior and activity from you but when the refugees are trying to seduce the players maybe the players get seduced and then the tentacles come out of wherever and we get our um, eldritch uh, horrors coming through on that one so there we are the transient one this is the last question i will be taking for tonight as we are out of time the transient one says do you have any tips for promoting a feeling of surrealism whilst running a false hydra. Surrealism is really cool, and you have to be careful, though, because describing to the players as they walk into a room, they see on the wall a very large elephant. It's a painting of an elephant, but it has five legs, and one of the legs appears to be moving in the painting. But when they look at the painting, the entire elephant bursts into a butterfly and flies across the ceiling to turn into a lamp post on the other side of the room. The players are going to think that there are all kinds of weird and wonderful things going on and that it's it, it's it's going to be absolute chaos. So, yeah, it's all that kind of stuff. It's it's but make sure it ends as well and that if one player succeeds, the other players continue to have these sort of things. I think the other thing is is they shouldn't be interactable. The players should see this stuff and if they try and stop it or dispel it, it just doesn't work. Uh, that would be my advice. Um but yes, there we go. All right. So, folks, it's been great chatting with you. A uh, little bit of news. Um, like I said, I've got some players who are very keen, very keen on doing some more role playing with me, which is fantastic. I've spoken to them and we will probably be able to do uh, longer sessions, but only once a week because that's all that we uh, would be able to fit in. And again, I think also people are planning now. It's going well. After a month or two, things might return to normal. So we've got to make sure that those are then definitely, definitely sustainable moving forward. So there is that to look forward to. They won't be as manic as the Konbari episodes in terms of timing. Tomorrow I plan, although don't hold me to this, to finish writing the Tri-System RPG, which you can find on our Discord channel, discord.gg forward slash greatgm, which is a new role-playing system that I've been working on for a while now with input from various people and, and the community as well. And uh, it's just a bit of a uh, light system, although it's kind of getting a little bit heavier now as we develop the rules but anyway so that will be available and next week we return to regular gm channel stuff so two videos will be coming out next week i'm not sure exactly which ones they are but they will be coming out next week and then i will be back on saturday saturday at 7 p.m gmt to do the hello world series we continue building our kingdom and whatever else happens to come up uh, during that particular stream and then, of course, back again on Sunday for live sessions with a GM. And I think that's all I needed to tell you. Uh, other than go have a look at this Kickstarter, this uh, Heroic Challenges. I've got 843 followers already. It does drop a little bit later on this month, I know. Uh, the cards are really good quality. And if you did want to pick up a copy of these uh, Wilderland Voyages or the Curious Treasures or the Fun Bull Searches, again, lawsmith.com, and that's L-O-R-E-S-M-Y-T-H, Laws, Myth, basically, dot com. And you can get a copy from them. Until then, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. Oh! <laughs>